In this video, I want to discuss the dynamics of interpersonal relationships and some of the things that go into that. Uh, first of all, let's discuss why these relationships matter. First of all, we engage in interpersonal relationships because we have this inherent need to belong. And it exists more strongly in some of us than in others. Some of us are better at uh, kind of being on our own, but and some of us really desperately need that connection. But, but at some level, we all have this need to belong. It's just part of human nature. We have this need to to be engaged in relationships with others and to, to be involved with other people. So, uh, Also, relationships bring rewards. These relationships matter because these relationships can bring us reward. They bring, first of all, emotional rewards and a way to express our emotions and to build our emotions and to just engage with other people on an emotional level. They bring uh, These interpersonal relationships bring emotional rewards. They also can bring material rewards. Maybe you know somebody who has a, a pontoon boat that you can go out and enjoy, or they have a pool, or they have a truck that you can borrow when you move, or whatever. They bring these material rewards as well, so these relationships do at times. And they also bring health rewards. Having these social relationships and, and family relationships and positive relationships in our lives can help us push ourselves to be healthier. We have people to keep us accountable. We have people, quite frankly, to live for and, and reason to be healthy and, and do these things. So these relationships can bring health rewards for us as well. But they also carry costs as well as rewards. So, um, for example, this uh, image is famous from friends. You know, there's a cost. You know, at some point you may have to help somebody move or, or they may call on you for some sort of material reward or it may just be a draining emotional experience for you. Uh, but they carry costs as well as rewards. And the nature of personal relationships is such that close relationships require commitment. If we're going to be involved in close interpersonal relationships, then we have to be committed to those relationships, the good and the bad, the highs and the lows. And so they require commitment for us to, to be involved in those. They also foster inter interdependence. So we've talked about that term in other videos, but interdependence is uh, this idea that we are connected with other people, that what happens to them impacts us, whether it's, you know, they're having a good day and so then that helps us have a good day, or they find out that they're uh, expecting a baby, so that makes us feel good. And good things happen to them make us feel good and vice versa bad things happen to them and it makes us feel bad and, or has an impact on us like that the ripples in a pond when you throw a stone in a, in a calm pond those ripples uh, echo out and they do in interpersonal relationships as well what happens to one person in one of those relationships will impact uh, others involved in, with that person they also require continuous investment they require us to continually be putting in and to build that relationship you can't just let it lie stagnant and expect that relationship to continue in the same way we have to invest in those relationships in all those different ways that we discussed. And they can also spark dialectical tensions, right? So dialectics we'll talk about in a few minutes, but uh, uh, but dialectics basically are these things within us that pull us in different directions, and other people may be being pulled in an opposite direction from us. So they can spark these dialectical tensions within us. And, um, so we need to understand that about these per interpersonal relationships as well. So let's talk a little bit about why we form and maintain these social bonds. One of the, one of the primary uh, theories surrounding this, uh, the formation in particular of social bonds and, and interpersonal relationships of all sorts, whether that's a romantic relationship, a friendship, a, uh, a workplace relationship, or family relationship, but the formation of those uh, in some respects comes down, it can be described by attraction theory. Uh, and attraction theory says that, that people are attracted to one another and form these bonds initially for a variety of, of factors, or because of a variety of factors, and those factors include the following. First, appearance. Whether we like it or not, whether we think it's shallow or not, we are attracted to people based on appearance. Um, we all have maybe a style of person that we're looking for, even if it's just the type of clothing that they're wearing, or the way that they cut their hair, or, you know, but it could be something about their bodily appearance, and uh, we all have certain things that, that we find more attractive than others. And so, again, whether we like to admit it or not, because it's it seems so shallow, but at some level, appearance does factor in. Now, we find that to be less of a factor the more we get to know someone, then appearance becomes less of a factor in our uh, desire to maintain a relationship with them. But at least in the initial formation of relationships, appearance is a factor. It's not the only factor, but it is a factor. Proximity is another factor. We, we tend to develop and form relationships with those people who are closer to us, that we spend a lot of time with. So that's why you see a lot of friendships and relationships coming out of the workplace where we spend a lot of time there, or we're more likely to develop a friendship or relationship with somebody who lives in our neighborhood than we are with somebody who lives all the way across the world that we're never around and we don't experience. So proximity has an impact on how we choose and whether we choose to form a relationship with somebody initially. Similarities has an impact. Similarity has an impact on us. 
So we like people who are like us. That's not too shocking, right? We like people who have the same interests as us, uh, who like the same things as us, who support the same things we do. We like people who are like us. But at the same time, we like people who are different than us, which is where complementarity comes in. We also like people who bring something different to the table than we do. We like people who complement us in different ways. Now, these would seem to be mutually exclusive, but they're really not. In fact, the best relationships and the longest the longest lasting relationships are formed out of a relationship that shares both similarity and complementarity. Someone we share a lot of with and, and have a lot of the same interests and same things we enjoy, but somebody who maybe also brings something else out of us and, and brings something different to the table. When we have that combination of similarity and complementarity, we see a much stronger bond form. And, and so, but those are both factors in forming relationships. Competence. We like people who are competent. We like people who can carry on a conversation and keep up with that, keep up with us intellectually. So we like people who are competent, but not too competent, right? Because we also don't want to feel stupid. We, we tend to not form relationships with people who are way smarter than us because we don't want to feel inferior to them. But we like people who are competent. And that's a, that's a factor in attraction toward another person and whether or not we're going to form a relationship with that person. Disclosure. We find it, uh, to be a compliment when people disclose to us it's also a way that we determine whether or not we have similarities and complementarities and things like that but disclosure is an important factor in uh, attraction to another person initially when somebody's willing to disclose to us or we feel comfortable disclosing to them it's more likely that we're going to be interested in forming a bond with that person reciprocation is another one when we disclose and and, and when that other person shares with us when they like us we like people who like us right we like people who find us to be funny and find us to be attractive and and they reciprocate that interest in us we like that so um, so we're interested in people who are interested in us and who reciprocate all of those types of uh, signals and the rewards again like appearance something we don't like to think about a lot because we, we think it's too shallow or whatever but we tend to form relationships with people who can bring us uh, rewards so there are other types of attraction, or t other types of theories though, surrounding the forming and maintaining a social bond. Um, some of those include these. Uncertainty reduction theory um, we, states that the more we get to know someone, the more likely we are to be interested in them, or at least that provides that opportunity, again, developing uh, through disclosure and, and uh, similarities, complementarities, things. But the more we get to know someone, and the more we reduce uncertainty about that person, the more likely we are to uh, form a relationship with that person, or maybe not. Predicted outcome value theory states that um, we basically make guesses as to whether or not this person is going to bring positivity and good things to us or whether it's going to be more hassle than it's worth. And we make a decision based on that as to whether or not we want to pursue and maintain that relationship. And then social exchange theory, you can see here the basic formula for social exchange theory, benefits minus the costs equal the outcome. That's what social exchange theory is. We take a look at the benefits that this relationship is providing or could provide for us. We, and then we subtract the costs of that what's what's this relationship costing us uh, not just in financial terms but emotional terms and material terms and health terms and all those things we we factor all that together and then at the end if the benefits outweigh the cost then we are more likely to form and or pursue and maintain a relationship with that person than we are if the if the costs outweigh the benefits then we're less likely to pursue a, a relationship or maintain a relationship with that person so uh, anyway just some different perspectives on the formation and maintain, maintaining of those social bonds. Then we can also look at the different uh, ways that uh, some different models that we use to kind of identify the different um, development of relationships. So, for example, uh, this is Knapp's staircase model of relational development. Uh, it demonstrates kind of the stages of, of relationship development. You can see it, it is formed in a staircase uh, type model here. Uh, but Knapp basically says that we go through the, just these different stages. And not all relationships will go through all the stages. And some relationships will go up a few steps and then maybe scoop back a step or whatever. But but uh, but uh, I think if you look at these and, and get to know these stages, you'll see that, that uh, there's some value in being able to see relationships as, as they progress through these different stages. So starting with initiating, where we're just, just interacting with somebody for the first moments and then experimenting, engaging in small talk and so forth through the intensification of that relationship, where we start to see the development of an individual relationship there. And, and then on through, uh, if, it, if it continues to, to go, we, we would end up on the backstage maybe. Some relationships will end up on the backstairs here where they uh, will fizzle out over time and, and uh, move through those stages. But um, but it's just, just one conceptual model of 
uh, seeing how relationships develop and then maybe deteriorate depending on uh, the situation. And again, not all relationships will go through all of these phases. Um, some of them will fizzle out well before that. Some of them, you know, you start getting to know somebody through small talk and experimenting and you say, that's enough for me. I don't think I'm interested. And it stops there and never gets any further. Uh, but I think if we if we look at these stages, we could probably all identify at different points where we've had a relationship that has experienced these different stages. Another uh, model for examining uh, relationship development and maintenance uh, is dialectical perspectives, which I referred to earlier. So dialectical perspectives basically say that we have all these things within us and they pull us in different directions. And let's just take a look at the first one as an example. Um, integration versus separation. So we all have this desire to be connected, to be integrated with another person, right? And as a relationship grows, well, then we feel that even more strongly to be integrated and to be, you know, connected with that person in such a way that that uh, that will, you know, almost one with them. So uh, we have this desire for integration, but at the same time, within us, we have this desire for autonomy and separation, a desire to be independent and to kind of do our own thing. And these two things are battling within us at all times. And the pendulum swings back and forth, and sometimes it's in the middle. But, but so we have these this these different poles in our lives, which is complicated, right? That makes things complicated. Then you throw in the fact that the other person also has these dialectics going on inside of them. They're feeling this need for integration, but also this need for separation. And it works out really well when you're both feeling the same thing. If you're both feeling integration, then you're then you're fine. You're fine being like this. If you're both feeling separation, then that doesn't mean you know you end the relationship, but you're both fine pursuing you know your individual interests for that moment, and and you both feel that. But when when one of you is feeling integration and the other is feeling separation, that's when you can get to some conflicts and some challenges within relationships um, that that, uh, that people are experiencing these different dialectics. So it's complicated within you. It's complicated further by the fact that there's another person involved and they're having these things. And the combination of is really complicated. And then you consider the fact that there are dozens of these dialectics at work, not just one. You have integration, separation, stability versus change, where we, we like to keep things the same. We like the comfort of familiarity, but we also like novelty. We like to do different things. We like to have change. Uh, we have expression versus privacy. What is it that, you know, some some people, we're going to have this feel to express ourselves and to be known to other people as well. And then there's this idea of privacy and keeping some, some things to ourselves. Again, there's dozens of these dialectics, and, and they happen with all, within all of us, which just really complicates, and there are ways to manage them. But the first step is just recognizing that they're there, quite frankly, and and, uh, and then understanding that the other person has these things as well, and uh, so seeing how we can match them up and, and, and manage them as best as possible. So there are a variety of ways that we look at relationships, including you know, just models that we use, like the staircase model and these dialectical perspectives. But uh, but in any case, it's important that we understand the dynamics of these relationships and that they are complicated things, that they are kind of living things, living, breathing things, that they will change over time. And, and, uh, and we will experience all these different things. So if you have questions about the dynamics of interpersonal relationships, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, I'm always available via email. In the meantime, happy communicating.